Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the um, afternoon sessions or keynote sessions. Um, my name is Gary Wong, and from the Faculty of Education in the University of Hong Kong, and uh, I will be chairing this session. So, welcome. Um, so, before I uh, turn the time to the keynote speaker, Professor Rosanna Chen, and I would like to introduce her and, um, and uh, so so that you all know about her backgrounds and her topic today. Um, so, Professor. Rosanna Chen, and she's uh, currently associated with the uh, Uni Chinese University of Hong Kong, and uh, she's the founding chair of the education chapters of IEEE Hong Kong Session, and current member at large of the IEEE Education Society Board of Governor, and she's affiliated with the Department of Information Engineering at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and uh, Rosanna has a uh, multidisciplinary backgrounds in information engineering, educational psychology, and learning sciences. Her research areas cover human-computer interaction, social media analytics, and engineering education with main focus in engineering epistemologies and engineering learning mechanisms. She has published over 50 journal articles and referee research papers in publications venues such as IEEE Transitions on Education, Computers and Education and Proceedings of IEEE. And uh, Rosanna received her Bachelor of Engineering, uh, Master of Philosophy, Master of Education and PhD degrees all from the Chinese Un University of Hong Kong. And today we are very honored to have Rosanna to um, share with us the topics on the um, Social Epistemic Conditions in Engineering Learning, Theory, Pedagogies and Analytics. And uh, before I turn the time to Rosanna, and I would like to remind all the participants and attendants today to uh, fill up the uh, evaluations by the end of the sessions. And your comments will definitely be valuable to us in, in the future organization of the uh, CITES conference. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, welcome Rosanna Chen, Professor Chen. Dr. Gary Wong for the introduction, and I would like to thank uh, Hong Kong USAID for organizing this symposium, as well as the invitation from the education chapter of the IEEE Hong Kong section for inviting me to give this speech in the session. Um, today, uh, this afternoon, I have the privilege to meet many of the educational researchers and experts, and we share common research interests in areas such as learning theory, pedagogy, or learning analytics. But I would like to bring your focus to something that might sound less familiar with you, namely social epistemic cognition and engineering learning. Today's talk is drawn upon my published or ongoing research findings as well as my personal teaching experience in an engineering faculty for more than 10 years. So this is the flow of my talk. Um, based on social epistemic cognition, I will share about this theory and then the learning analytic of it, as well as the learning design through presenting an implementation case in engineering education. To begin with, I'm sure that every one of you here know how to pronounce this word with that makeup of four characters. How about this? Even if I change the back letter E into small letter one, you can still say it aloud as STEM. However, if I remove the E here, then it just become an acronym without any vowel, and probably you you you'd have no way to pronounce it. In fact, it is the common presentation or representation of STEM education in the context of K-12 schooling. It's to most of the students and teachers in K-12 education, they may not have formal opportunity to expose to engineering education. 
Also, engineering is not a subject domain until students become uh, undergraduate level. Engineering problems in the current society is often complex and multifaceted. And the challenge faced by the engineers as well as the engineering students are further intensified by new technology such as 5G communication network, big data, AI. So while design engineering program should not only focus on engineering disciplinary knowledge, but also transdisciplinary capability building for our students. For example, the United Nations has announced a set of 17 sustainable development goals in the December of uh, 2015. These are the goals that are crucial for the survival of humanity in the future. And engineering educators had been called upon to ensure that our graduates have developed the capability for uh, a sustainable development in the society. In fact, the engineering education communities demand for research results that can inform about the collection and analysis, similar to the way in educational research, of scientific evidence in students' learning, and in particular, engineering students' learning. And here are some of the associations uh, in our area that uh, default into the research in engineering education. For example, the American Society of Engineering Education, ASEE, that will have a uh, flagship conference uh, in this month in Salt Lake City, Utah. And we also have the IEEE Education Society. So this is the society that I come from. And you can see that last year, we had a very successful event, the TAIL Conference in Hong Kong. And it is uh, uh, organized by uh, our, our key person, Dr. Gary Wong. So it has been very, very successful. And we also have uh, set up the IEEE Education Society Technical Committee on Learning Sciences. I'm sure that uh, maybe most of you are familiar with learning sciences. However, it is something that uh, is quite unfamiliar to the engineers. So our purpose for setting up the technical committee is to line up the education world as well as the engineer world. Um, over the recent year, the engineering education research community also uh, very interested in a topic that we call it engineering epistemology. Epistemology corresponds to the theory of knowledge. In particular, engineering epistemology, which is amongst one out of the five pillars in engineering education research agenda, correspond to uh, the knowledge and knowing, where the kind of knowledge and knowing is uh, related to engineering. So in book six of Aristotle's Lecomachine uh, Ethics, he mentioned five dispositions that a soul or a person must have in attaining to truth. These five components are very often referred to as intellectual virtues. They are, uh, I may not be able to, to pronounce each of them in Greek, but they can roughly be translated to craftsmanship or art or technical skill. Secondly, scientific knowledge. Thirdly, prudence, wisdom, as well as intelligence. Um, there are two terms that particularly uh, draw my attention. The first one, episteme, which corresponds to scientific knowledge, um, as well as the technique, right, which is 
the Greek word word of technology. So here, what is the difference between episteme and techne, or scientific knowledge versus craftsmanship, technical skills, or art? So according to Aristotle, what is scientifically knowable is learnable, and scientific knowledge can be communicated. And for someone who is exploring the scientific knowledge or have scientific knowledge, the origin is outside him or her, but the origin is known to this person. However, on the contrary, for techni, which correspond to craftsmanship or technical skills, um, it deals with bringing something that does not exist by nature. And it is to produce something deliberately in a way that can be reasonably explained. And the craft concerned with things that are not exist itself, and the origin is not outside the producer. The origin instead is in the producer. So what does it imply to engineering education? So for me, I perceive, so this is my perception. Scientists, they investigate things which already exist. So that's what episteme implies. However, for engineers who manifest technically, they produce, based on true reasons, things that do not exist. There are also three more intellectual virtues component, prudence, wisdom, and intelligence. They are also very important to the engineering profession. So in recent years, more and more emphasis has been placed on engineering graduate attributes. Um, we have organizations like uh, the AVAT and the Hong Kong IE which are the accreditation bodies that examine or review engineering programs provided by, for example, uh, all universities in Hong Kong that run engineering programs, including Hong Kong U, UST, as well as uh, Chinese U, and man many more other universities. So they define right, a set of 12 attributes that we call GAs, right, the graduate attributes, they correspond to the skills and competencies that the engineering graduates are supposed to have upon their graduation, which can be roughly uh, characterized, uh, categorized into engineering disciplinary knowledge and holistic competencies or generic skill. For example, um, engineering disciplinary knowledge include I just read it with one of those aloud. An ability to apply knowledge of mathematics, science, and engineering appropriate to the degree discipline. This is an example. So how about holistic competencies? It includes, for example, an ability to function on a multidisciplinary teams, and an ability to identify, formulate, and solve engineering problem, and know about the impact of engineering solutions to the society and global economic context. There are also uh, GAs that correspond to practical skill. For example, the ability to use uh, tools, computer software, to help understanding the engineering processes and limitations. So based on these kind of needs, the engineering education research community recently uh, have a very hot discussion about the cognitive process within engineering students along their uh, development path. For example, in the latest call for papers, right, in the special issues in the IEEE transaction on engine uh, not engineering, but IEEE transaction on education. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about this journal, IEEE transaction on education. It's a very special 
journal because it's published by the IEEE. IEEE is the largest engineering professional organization in the world, but we have the Education Society that focuses on the education of engineering programs, students, etc. So we have our own journal, and it's uh, uh, ISI. Uh, it has impact factors, right? So it's <laughs> uh, so I also encourage uh, uh, our, our professor or researchers here to submit uh, into our journal, right? So we have um, a special issue uh, in that have a deadline in August. So the topic that we look for is um, the cognitive development in engineering or science students along their um, training or education. So even for the engineers, even for our community, we also begin to look at some of the framework, seminal frameworks, for example, the one from uh, Perry, William Perry, uh, which have nine positions. So this nine position scheme uh, elicits the stage along the undergraduate students when they enter to university until they graduate. So uh, it can roughly be divided into three different uh, uh, levels. So along their path, from number one to number nine, they move away from simple dualism, which only believe that things exist in the world, can only be right, either right or wrong, to uh, a more mature status of contextual rel relativism which is the understanding and the realization that other people also have their point of views uh, and also have their belief and reasoning to the final stage, that is after realizing the dualism's limitation as well as uh, the existence of contextual relativism Engineering, oh, sorry, <laughs> students, undergraduate students in general, when they are more mature, will be able, should be able to commit themselves on their professional roles and identity. So that's the later stage of evolving of commitment. So our purpose as an engineering educator or educators in other disciplines um, are called upon to build or facilitate a learning path that can develop our students, that move away from simple dualism to relativism, to finally the commitment to a professional identity and role, for example, in engineering, in medicine, or in education. And then, talking about the cognitive process involved, um, that's how I introduce the main characters in this talk, social epistemic cognition. Uh, social epistemic cognition, or SEC, I call it, is a construct, is a uh, conceptual construct that I establish in the field of human computer interaction. That is the current research area in engineering that I come from. So originally, it is a contract in XGI, and my purpose for establish, establishing it is to explain, is to try providing a theoretical background to explain the knowledge-driven social interaction involved in internet user. That was my original purpose. So let me uh, explain a little bit about its detail before I present some of the findings and implication of it. So SEC refers to the human individual's cognition and cognitive processes related to knowledge and knowing when situated in a social context. There can be many, many examples of social contexts, for example, online learning communities or Wikipedia, etc. And this is based on a tripartite root in epistemology cognition and social cognition. So it's a triangular uh, kind of visualization. And it has three main components. The first one is Bandura's social cognition. Maybe this 
picture is familiar to most of you. Um, so it is from Bandur's social cognitive theory or social learning theory that have three major components. And individuals believe P, that is his cognitive belief and his inner uh, values can be affected and related to the externally observable behavior of this person, which in fact can also be influenced and influencing the external environment. So this is Bandua's key idea, P, B, and E. They are interrelated and they can affect one another. For example, if I believe in something and then I send something uh, to an online forum based on my understanding, so the action of typing something in the keyboard and sending it onto the internet is an external behavior because, we, because I physically interact with the keyboard and then to change something. What has been changed is the online environment. And the online environment can actually be accessed and readable by other individuals. In that way, the other person's, other people's belief can be affected right, by my belief. So this is the key idea of Bandura's social cognition. And the second component in SEC is epistemic cognition. So researcher such as uh, Kitchener, uh, she performed an experiment with graduate students in English language. And three different levels of cognitive activities can be discovered when the graduate student uh, going through their comprehension activities. The first level is cognition. It corresponds to activities such as read, write, that is the perception level, uh, the receival of information. So it is a basic cognition level. And the second level is method cognition. This term may also be uh, familiar to most of the educational researchers. This is the cognition about cognition to self-regulate the first level cognitive processes. And the highest level, the third level, which uh, Kitchener called it epistemic cognition. You can see uh, it's a kind of cognition related to epistemology. Right? And it is driven by epistemic aims. So in 2011, uh, a famous learning science and educational psychology researcher, Ka Chin, he further um, proposed a five-component EC framework right, in his seminal paper, uh, which is rooted in epistemology and, uh, and in philosophy. So in Kachin's easy framework, he defined five components. Right? The first one is epistemic aims and values, which correspond to the intention of knowledge-related cognitive activities. Second one is structure of knowledge, uh, which is about uh, how knowledge is organized, ontology, etc. The third one, source, justification, and epistemic stances, which correspond to the stances of whether, for example, absolute truth exists or not. Right? And the fourth one, epistemic virtues, as well as vices, right? which corresponds to, um, which is similar to the concept right, of Aristotle's intellectual virtues that I mentioned. Is the good or bad disposition that one has in the process of pursuit of truth or attainment to the truth. And the last one is the process of achieving epistemic aims. It corresponds to processes like having argumentation, discussion, uh, uh, literature review. That is the process involved in the inquiry, right? in knowledge-driven inquiry. So uh, I highly recommend you to uh, refer to Kachin's paper for the detail of these five components. Right. So, epistemic cognition is also one of the major components in the SEC framework. And my SEC framework inherits all of these five components, but I focus on the social dimension 
of these five components. In fact, each of the five components here has been widely investigated and discussed by the epistemologist right, in the philosophy field for over hundreds of years. For example, epistemic aims, the philosophers, uh, uh, in particular epistemologists, right, they have ever mentioned about uh, different level of epistemic aims. For example, the lowest level right, is minimally justified belief and higher is the propositional knowledge, right, based on um, the definition that uh, knowledge is uh, justified true belief upon some condition. Right? Even for the definition of knowledge, they have a lot of argument and discussion already. So based on JTB, the JTB concept, right, of course, uh, they, they also further have discussion about like uh, gut tears problem, but I don't talk about that uh, today. So based on the definition all right, of knowledge, they can already uh, classify different levels of uh, epistemic aims, knowledge related aims. Um, so meaningfully, mean, minimally justified belief is the lowest one, and then they have propositional knowledge, which is the common, our common an understanding about knowledge. And then uh, move up to an understanding, which is the development of a semantic network structure of different knowledge components. And once you have understand a, a, well, uh, a good understanding of a domain knowledge, then this is a time that you can contrast new knowledge based on your understanding. Of course, the highest goal right, is the attainment to truth. However, to some of the philosophers or epistemologists, they don't agree that truth exists. Um, this is a very personal stance. Uh, for my, allow me to express my stance. My stance is I believe absolute truth exists and it is possible for human to acquire knowledge. This is also the assumption that I've stated in my uh, paper that, that I proposed, SDC. Right? But you, uh, you may not need to agree with my stance. You may think that uh, there's, no there's no truth exists. Right? So that's, that's all right, based on the contextual uh, relativism all right. uh, I, I understand that different people can have different stands. Right? Okay, I don't, I don't, I, I don't uh, stay here, but I would like to move on, on to the third component in my SEC frameworks, um, social epistemology. In particular, here I follow Goldman, uh, Elvin, Professor Elvin Goldman's um, framework of social epistemology. So he emphasizes on the social dimension of epistemology. Right? That is the social dimension of belief formation, knowledge acquisition, and information processing, etc. So in Goldman's social epistemology framework, um, there are three uh, sorry, there are three major components. First of all, individual dosatic agent. Right? Dosatic is related to the work dosa, uh, which is the Greek work of belief. Right? While episteme is the Greek work for knowledge, in particular scientific knowledge, right? dosa is belief. Right? So everyone are entitled to some in inner belief states. So individual dosatic agents refer to any intelligent agent. Uh, normally, it is a human person. Right? Uh, any, uh, in, any intelligent agents and Goldman proposed that uh, the individual dosatic agents, they are able to act and their inner belief state can be externally represented by social evidence that are externally observable and measurable. For example, if I believe that right, engineering is good, uh, please study engineering and I really uh, say it aloud so that now you know that I have this kind of belief. Or I even uh, put it onto a PowerPoint, right, a slice, so the PowerPoint content become a piece of social evidence that you can also assess and you can also, of course, 
run some Python program NLP right to analyze the content right so this is the uh, concept of Goldman's social epistemology in particular IDAs so the second component in Goldman's uh, framework is collective dosatic agent right collective dosatic agent that is a group of individual uh, dosatic agents or you can view it as a group of for example students and they have the common access to the collective knowledge uh, represented in the green box or right, in this picture so everyone in this collective dosatic agents group can have access to the collective evidence within this group and they any one of them can change it all right and and can read it so this is the key idea and the third component is epistemic system okay. epistemic system as i put down here a social system that maintain social practices procedures and pattern of interactions between agents that they can uh, affect the epistemic outcomes of the entire group one example of epistemic system is for example wikipedia right wikipedia um, can be accessed by uh, essentially anyone and then uh, anyone can contribute uh, social evidence all right onto wikipedia and to be accessed by any other individual dosatic agents so you if you view it systematically it become a visualization like this so i further um, visualize uh, epistemic system ida's as well as cda's as this picture so what an online social environment can be is something like this right we have different IDAs and at the same time they are also different groups of CDAs and they can produce social evidence and because of the hyperlink right, and, and, and the internet uh, capability and connectivity the social evidence nowadays can be searchable and reachable by uh, essentially anyone uh, all of the IDAs in this global epistemic system of the World Wide Web so this is the situation we have if we break down the internet right uh, and and view it according to Goldman's SE framework so going back to my SEC this is the interaction between an IDA who has the inner belief state and the information which is the social evidence in front of him or her so SEC correspond to the cognition and cognitive process in this human information interaction. Okay, thank you. So SEC by itself is still the internal cognitive process within an ind individual person, but it is situated in a social epistemic system, which is complex and consists of other individuals who also possess SEC similar to this agent as well as the social evidence right, that can be accessible by everyone and in fact the big data that we are talking about nowadays is a kind of social evidence uh, so uh, let's use the example of Wikipedia again so the social evidence produced become a um, source of big data because they are a piece of online material that uh, is big in volume uh, and then they, they have been generated in a high velocity etc so in this way uh, why SEC originally was proposed as an XGI construct in the engineering domain this was because I would like to understand about human information interaction in the world of big data. So that's my original purpose. And then um, I have also proven um, SEC uh, with some experiment, all right, including, for example, uh, I've 
constructed and validated an instrument, which is a 32 items epistemic cognition instrument. So I developed the instrument based on Clark Chin's framework, and I tested it with uh, 563 participants from different disciplines, but mainly at the university level. And then uh, I validated the five component structure, all right? And I further proven my theory, which I call it SEC in online interaction, in which the mediation effect of online interaction on SEC have been proven. Right. So, based on all these, uh, I always have two questions in mind as an engineering educator. First of all, to what extent do SEC influence engineering learning in the 21st century? And secondly, how can we design meaningful engineering learning experience to foster and assess uh, engineering students' SEC? So, this come to the second part of my speech. All right, now, uh, I, I will speed up, no worry. <laughs> so, now I'd like to talk about the learning analytic and share with you some of my findings right, of SEC based on MO, uh, based on MOOC big data. So nowadays, uh, we are familiar with MOOC and there's a lot of MOOC and it becomes a very important learning venue for STEM subjects. And for Chinese U of Hong Kong, we also have our own Coursera platform. And one of the MOOCs is in information theory, and it is provided by my colleagues, Professor Raymond Yang, and it has been subscribed by uh, over, over tens of thousands of uh, online learners. And we are also doing some kind of learning analytic, right, uh, on the MOOC for information theory. Um, so, I'd like to share with you some of the funding obtained from my postgraduate students. Um, they investigated the MOOC, uh, a, a, a most popular, one of the most popular MOOC provided by Andrew Ng from Stanford University on Coursera. Right? So it's the uh, machine learning MOOC. And so these are the number of participants in their early implementation. And their study was performed on session one involving 4,700 of participants. What we have done is, the, first of all, a temporal social network analysis. Um, so maybe uh, some of you doing an learning analytics will be familiar with uh, SNA. It's the analysis of a structure of a social network based on mathematical graph theory, where the nodes represent the learners and the link between uh, two nodes represent the interaction or the relationship between the two learners. So this is the basis of uh, uh, SNA. So what we have done is that we have uh, analyzed the interaction, the online interaction patterns of these uh, 4,000 MOOC learner, uh, and then we divided it into 10 different weekly time intervals. Sorry, that is a little bit blur. And this one is the overall social network resulted from these uh, thousands of online learners. Right? And we, after constructing the social matrix, we run um, Python program, Network X, right, to obtain centrality measurements such as the degree centrality, between the centrality, closeness centrality. So these are the matrices uh, representing all right, the activities level of uh, the, the learners inside the social networks. Right? Um, so if you are not familiar with the term, uh, you can fill, it, fill them as some metrics measuring the social interaction activities. Right? And then somehow you can see some uh, emerging patterns right, on this kind of centrality. And then, what is the relationship between SEC and the MOOC learner? So what we have done is to construct an epistemic terms dictionary based on the philosophy literature. Right? So these consists of, the dictionary consists of words that are related and can 
suggest that someone is engaging in knowledge-driven activities, for example, justification, argumentation, the use of warrant to support their claim, etc. So we refer to the philosophy, epistemology literature and develop the dictionary that consists of uh, 110 terms, very carefully selected. And two independent researchers developed this, and then we ver uh, verify the reliability and combat alphas higher than <laughs> Paul Knight, which is quite appreciable. And we further validated our dictionary with small data. Uh, with a uh, hundred of uh, students and confirm the statistically significant relationship between the occurrence of the usage of epistemic terms right, of these students and their academic performance. Okay. So we further develop two more dictionaries, a keyword dictionary that is obtained by processing all materials in the machine learning MOOC and we have processed over one million of words using Python program, all right, not manually. So we develop a keyword dictionary that we extract the terms right, uh, uh, from, from the uh, materials and we also develop a dosatic term dictionary that implies the uh, less vigorous argument like I think, I agree, disagree, etc. And we use lateral language processing technique to analyze it. So our result is that we are able to find uh, the quantitative patterns right, from the online discourse, right, including the pattern of social interactions, the social matrices like centrality, as well as the usage of epistemic terms that implies that the online learner are engaging in epistemic activity, probably exercising their SEC. And then we confirm statistical significance relationship between SNA and epistemic terms and keyword usage. Right? Since my time may not be enough, so I move on to the third one. And, and you can actually refer the results to uh, the papers that my postgraduate students publish. Um, so lastly, um, how about the implication to engineering learning right, or pedagogical design? So I'd like to share with you one of the recent cases that uh, I uh, conducted in my own teaching. So nowadays, uh, we have the concept of direct and indirect evidence and we're talking about evidence-based practice. Indirect evidence for example, can be questionnaire survey, which only measure the belief of the participant, right? which may not be a very accurate measurement of their learning. It's just their belief. Huh? Do you believe that, do you think or do you agree that the teacher or the course is excellent? Right? Um, on the contrary, direct evidence, for example, uh, written exam, essay or quizzes, embedded assignment, in the course measure what the student actually have learned. Um, so we have these two different kind of evidence in our assessment. However, uh, okay, while the measurement of domain knowledge, for example, testing whether uh, the students has mastered engineering or mathematical knowledge can be assessed um, with direct evidence the generic skill, holistic competency, right? your ability to formulate uh, an interdisciplinary team, for example, is very difficult to be measured by direct evidence. But then, my SEC framework come into place because remember, SEC cover a component in social epistemology and we have a component of social evidence. Okay, let's Go back to the implementation context. This is a course that I just taught in last school year, and I included holistic competency into some of the learning outcomes, in addition to uh, the learning outcome in engineering knowledge. So this is the flow of my course. Okay, I uh, this topic is social media and human information interaction. It includes uh, concept and skills like. Uh, 
NLP, uh, natural language processing, content analysis, but it also includes concepts like uh, uh, sustainable development and big data, for example. So I asked my students to uh, work on policy report right, related to the UN SDG. And then at the same time, I also collect direct as well as indirect evidence from their learning. Direct evidences include um, the block that they compose because I ask every student in my class to maintain a class block. And not only that, they also, that, so this is the resulted social network, they also need to, so let me show uh, one of the blocks of my students. So we study things about NLP, right? We study topic about sustainable development. We also think about what is human cognition. And I also ask them, ask them to reflect upon important question. What is engineering and what does it mean to me as an engineering student? Right? After they develop this kind of blocks, they have to write Python program. <laughs> to analyze technically, right? To perform content analysis, to reflect about how they performed in this community. Right? And I also distribute questionnaire to collect the indirect evidence about their learning. Okay. So this is what I've done. Uh, I believe that I'm afraid that I, I, I may not have enough time. So um, I would like to, uh, after presenting the theory, and sharing about some of the research results of learning analytic related to SEC, and also share with you and uh, very briefly about an implementation implementation case in engineering education that that I put on some kind of learning design pedagogical design related to SEC into an engineering education context. Lastly, all right, to go back to today's theme, the symposium theme, engaging learning and empowering change. So I would like to provide three takeaways right, right, in response to the symposium theme. The first one, social epistemic cognition is a very rich philosophical construct established upon social cognition, social epistemology and epistemic cognition. So it provides a very rich philosophical and theoretical background for us to interpret the mechanisms and the dynamic involved in online interaction driven by epistemic purpose, that is knowledge driven goals. And it also covers important components such as epistemic virtues, right? Uh, tendency or whether you are brave or not when you see something wrong something wrong online whether you are brave enough to stand up and point out that no this is not right right so SEC is a very actually is a very rich theoretical framework secondly students intellectual virtues can be nurtured by engaging them in self-reflection on their professional roles and identities for example, in the block assignment that I asked my students right, to work on, I specify questions like, what is engineering? And what does it mean to me as an engineering student? So I, I deliberately asked them to write blog posts using this topic and have it be assessed by all other students in the class so that they can discuss. Like, um, for example, here, another student, after reading the blog, say, I totally agree with you. Take Wiki as an example. So this is the response provided by another student. And they can also bring in external resources to this class blog. I'm sure that the blogging activities may be a common practice in IT and application nowadays. But the SEC framework enables us to perform learning analytics, for example, by constructing epistemic term dictionary uh, and to compare it against various SNA matrices, 
right? So that we can have a better understanding about the dynamic and the involvement, engagement of our own students. Thirdly, and lastly, um, students as you see can be promoted and analyzed, right? By establishing an online learning community. Furthermore, you can always show the community content to people not only within the class, that's also for example, today I share my student post with you here. And there's some story in this student. Originally, he has been put on probation list, that is his performance is not satisfactory. However, you can see that uh, the content inside his blog post uh, is very well uh, written. Uh, and he, give, uh, he gave deep reflection on his professional roles as an engineer. So this is how SEC can be facilitated through online interaction, through the argumentation with other students, through constructive comments provided by the peer students. And then I, I told my student that I will share your blog content to people, to experts from uh, other universities, as well as uh, in this June, where I present at the ASEG conference, where the delegate also include people from the United Nations SDG groups. I will show my students' work to them. So to end my presentation today, it is my sincere invitation to all participants, no matter which discipline you come from, to join hand together with the engineers to engage learning and empower change in students from all disciplines for a more sustainable society in the future. How? you can join the IEEE <laughs> Education Society. Right? And I have to mention, uh, Dr. Gary Wong is the chairperson of the education chapter of IEEE Hong Kong Session. It is the largest, some advertisement time, it's the largest organization, professional organization in the world, consists of 400,000 of professional members of 160 countries. So you are invited to become one of us through joining the Education Society of the IEEE. Thank you. Okay, so thank you Professor Chen for her sharing and uh, to inspire us and, uh, and the profounding um, sharing with us. So we would like to open to the floor for uh, questions and interactions. So, feel free to raise your hands and ask questions. Yes. yes. Hello, Professor Chen, and th thanks for your presentation. I, I, I learned a lot from this. And I wonder, you mentioned uh, several times about the NLP in your uh, application. Could you please specify uh, how you use the NLP. Maybe NLP is a really large topic, but I, I, I'm a little curious about okay. your application. Okay. Thanks. So, thank you. So this is a good technical question. So uh, I think uh, yeah, you, you refer to the case that uh, the, my postgraduate student analyzed the Coursera content. Yes, we apply the NLP, and in particular, we uh, develop a dictionary. We use the dictionary-based approach to analyze our content. Actually, within NLP, there are different approaches to perform content analysis, like sentiment analysis, etc. And dictionary-based approach is only one of the approaches. Uh, other approaches also in, include uh, Bayesian uh, modeling, uh, supervised learning, and supervised learning, etc. So here um, uh, we use the the simple. Uh, this is the simplest one of the simplest approach, dictionary based approach. But the advantage is that we can develop and construct our own dictionary. So we uh, define one hundred and ten terms that. Uh, after consulting the epistemological literature, philosophy literature. So it includes words like understand, right, uh, or argument, or explain, or 
and let me recall <laughs> some some other terms uh, that suggest the person using the terms are involved in the epistemic process of meaningful uh, uh, argumentation, right? Making reason, making ju uh, justification, right? So we we develop this dictionary and then we apply it against the discourse collected from the forum under Andrew Ng's uh, MOOC. So along his MOOC, actually there's a online discussion forum where the participant can express their view. So we extract the text and throw everything into the Python program and we use this formula to calculate uh, the score. <laughs> So, it's a simple formula. It's the frequency of occurrence of the targeted words. So, W prime, I think I am loud enough. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. So, uh, where W prime are the words inside our dictionary, right? And uh, L, uh, alpha is the words produced by a particular participant, right? So we count the total number of occurrence of the epistemic words and divide it by the total number of occurrence of words in general, whatever words that have been used by particular uh, uh, learners. Right? And then we obtain the score that we call, for example, epistemic term score. And similarly, because we've also developed the dosatic terms dictionary that have less rigorous work, like I believe, I guess, all right? less certain than I understand, uh, this is my explanation, etc. Right? So we obtain the dosatic term scope. And then lastly, we also obtain the keywords dictionary that I've briefly mentioned. We study all of the work using Python program all of the words that appeared in the online learning materials in the MOOC, uh, which consists of more than or around one million of words. And we extract the lines, and then we construct the taxonomy that have ever appeared in, in, in this online course. So we can be able to compute the scores and then find out the patterns here. And we discover the interesting pattern is that when people are using or exercising their social epistemic cognition, having online argumentation, at the same time, surprisingly, they will also mention the keywords that appeared in the first week, the week one introduction, rather than other weeks. Rather than other weeks. So this is the funding uh, as implied in this picture. So, to some extent, SEC enable us to technically find out the relationship, the quanti quantified, uh, the quantitative relationship between epistemic term usage and the subject content, right, in a large scale. Right? In other, another study, independent study, uh, which is our ongoing work, we analyze over this time, uh, 140,000 of Khan Academy participants, and we found out some other interesting patterns. <laughs> uh, that I, uh, this is my ongoing research, and I, and I will submit and hopefully publish it soon. Right. So, uh, SEC enable us to uh, technically um, develop a lot of new methods. Right, to help understanding the cognition and cognitive process in, <coughs> in the online learning environment like at a large scale, for example in MOOC, as well as small scale, like the class block community. Oh, I hope I, I've answered the question. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I have one question. Say, um, this study seems to be related to the um, uh, en um, studying behavior of uh, for engineering subjects. Mm. 
Then uh, is there any uh, studies that uh, related the engineering studying behavior with the results? Say, um, or with this behavior is better so that uh, you can make use of these uh, map methodologies to uh, improve. Okay, thank right. you. I, I can, let me try answering your question uh, in this way. So along the study, the content analysis study, after we established the epistemic term dictionary, we have also validated it against the academic performance of, uh, unfortunately, they are all engineering students because I'm from engineering. So we validated it with small data and confirmed the statistical significance relationship between the occurrence, the usage of epistemic terms of an online learner. Uh, and the academic performance, that is, how, what is the final score that the student obtain. And we've proven uh, a significant or a uh, significant statistical relationship, which is the correlation all right, between the usage of epistemic term in the online discourse and the final academic performance. But this is on the small data scale. Uh, so I, I hope this is one of the studies that we have performed and, and can be partially answer your, your question. But of course, I hope that more, more research can be done uh, in other disciplines, all right, in, in other than engineering. So perhaps one more question, if there's any. If not, uh, let's give a applause of hands to uh, Professor Chen. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. So I encourage all of you to uh, submit your evaluations and also attend the, uh, the other sessions uh, after that. Thank you very much.